All right, Mikhail, Andrew, I'm going to start. If that's um, anybody, any objections, I'd like to, to get going. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. So if you want to put everyone on mute, that would be good. Thank you. Yeah, okay. And um, I need to turn off the birds. <laughs> <laughs> really Hitchcock movie. Okay, everyone, welcome. Welcome to this webinar to hear about how ProRail's been used with um, South London and Maudsley Hospital with a mentalization-based treatment. Um, I'm going to chair this webinar, and um, I'm going to introduce several people during the webinar that, that has, um, first of all, an introduction, and then Andrew Jackson, uh, the CEO of ProReal, is going to talk about how ProReal's being used in health. Um, I'm then going to introduce Penny Cutting, who's there, here beside me, who's going to talk about um, the treatment she used here at uh, Bethlehem Royal. And then Dr. Caroline Falcon is going to talk about her research. There will be a Q&A at the end, but in the meantime, um, uh, I think most of you have found the chat facility. Feel free to post any questions you have on chat, and we'll see them at this end. Uh, Penny has also said she's happy during her part of the presentation to take any questions you might have. Uh, so to do that, can you raise your hand? So you'll see there's a function on Zoom to raise your hand. Um, it's at the bottom of the chat box. Uh, so if you raise your hand, then when it comes to a kind of free moment, I'll give Penny a nudge and, and we'll take a question. And there will be a Q&A at the end. So we want to keep this... this um, Keep the questions coming. Penny's very happy for, for people to question as we go along uh, with inquiries about her work. And I'm sure it'll be the same with Caroline. Um, there's a few things on uh, uh, kind of con contracting. One is that um, patient confidentiality has been respected during this uh, webinar. Uh, Penny has changed the names of uh, the patients who participated in a in the case study she's going to discuss. The other thing I'd like to mention is that we are recording this session. Uh, a lot of people have asked, particularly because they're on holiday or couldn't make it today for the live webinar, so they've asked for a recording of the session. If any participants who are here now who are unhappy to continue participating because it's going to be recorded, um, uh, please feel free to leave. Um, okay, the first part of this is to talk about um, ProReal in mental health. And for that, I'm going to hand over to Andrew Dax Jackson, who's CEO of ProReal, and um, he's going to give us a short intro. Andrew, Thank over you. to you. Thanks, David. Um, hey, yeah, just um, welcome, everybody. Really good to have you on the uh, webinar. Really looking forward to hearing from Penny and from Caroline on this really important project of ours. A bit of background, we um, are uh, progressing and building our evidence base in uh, the world of mental health, working with clinicians, working with service user representatives representatives and really this project has been a landmark project for us particularly because of the connection with mentalization which ProReal seems to support very well. Um, you know a bit of history when we first came into the field we had a, a really strong early connection still have with MindTech. Caroline will tell you more about that organization later and through that a, an early connection to Peter Fonagy where the subject of mentalization came up very early on in discussions and, and through various contacts um, with uh, Dr. Paul Moran, one of the leading researchers into personality disorder, um, linking us as he was then at King's right through to Penny. So really, really grateful for a lot of help on the way that has got us here. Um, a lot of uh, standing on the shoulders of a lot of giants. And um, and I think Penny's work and Caroline's work will speak for itself. So I, I, I welcome you all to it. Please ask questions. Please engage with it. Um, yeah, over to you, David. Great. Thanks, Andrew. So I'm sat here um, at, at Bethlehem Royal with Penny, and I, I have to say to, that, that this is a wonderful trip down memory lane for me because I was brought up very close to here. That was um, I, my school was just down the road, so I love visiting here. But I came here a year ago. I think yeah. we've worked out 
when um, I did some training or trained Penny and a colleague in the use of ProReel. And um, since then, we've continued to connect. And, it, and it's a great honor and privilege I have to be sat here today um, to hear Penny share what's, uh, her, how she's experienced using ProReel over the last year. Um, lead um, clinical therapist here at um, Bethlehem and uh, amazing woman, I'm sure she's going to, you're going to introduce <laughs> yourself now. So if I hand over to you and um, and you can tell a bit of your story. Yeah, thank you. That's a glowing introduction. Thank you, David. So I'm the clinical service leader for the Croydon Personality Disorder Service and we're based at the Bethlehem Royal Hospital, a place called the Touchstone Centre. And we run a mentalisation based psychotherapy service for people with borderline personality disorder. It's an 18 month treatment program and we can have up to um, 32 patients in treatment at any one time. And um, the reason I got involved really was that um, uh, Paul Moran um, linked up with the consultant here, Steve Miller, um, to uh, when he'd heard about ProReal and thought, oh, that, that sounds like there might be some mileage in exploring that in terms of mentalization-based therapy. And so Andrew and Paul, Andrew Jackson and Paul Moran came here, met with me and um, Dr. Miller, and um, we talked about it. And it seemed to me that um, the core components of ProReal and uh, the way it was set up to help people identify thoughts and feelings and behaviours really fits well with a mentalisation based treatment which is all about trying to help people stay in touch with their thoughts and feelings and understand how those link with their behaviours and other people's behaviours so that they can navigate the social world in such a way as to get on in life rather than to experiences a series of challenges which often people with borderline personality have. So the participants can see the screen. Yeah, so what you see in front of you is um, the way we incorporated the um, ProReal into one of the tiny, the, one of the components of the overall treatment program. So we do groups and individual therapy here and we do a group called the Restoring Mentalizing Group which is a, um, a more explicit mentalising group. It's a way of um, helping people to take a step back and to review um, and think about situations that have gone fairly catastrophically wrong in terms of having a collapse in mentalising to the extent where they've either harmed themselves or they've harmed somebody else or got into a very difficult or dangerous situation. Mm. So the Restore Mentalising session is about helping people to um, explore in a group setting the process by which their mentalizing became really difficult and the event happened. Because for somebody with borderline personality disorder, they often will say, it just happened. This just happened. I don't understand it. It just happened. And so what we want to do is we want to try and, um, through taking a step back and providing this explicit mentalizing group to help them really understand that nothing just happens. There's a process um, that you go through there's a connection between thoughts and feelings that then lead to actions um, and further thoughts and feelings and that those have an impact on your relationships with other people. And, and how many would be in these groups? So um, up to eight at any one time. So we already offered this group and I saw a really good link with the ProReal software and mm. thought that we could um, do this um, test out whether it's feasible really and mm. acceptable because you don't ordinarily get a computer screen in your therapy session that's something that's mm. unusual certainly unusual for me i've never done anything like that before so that's how we how we got there so you'll see this is a on your screen you'll see the process that we go through so we start off the group starts off with um a, a brief outline of the event of what's happened we ask <clears throat> we ask the person to say what their experience at the time was we ask we move on and ask you know, looking at it now, is there anything else? Have we missed anything? And we encourage the other group members to ask those sorts of questions. We then move on to how do you feel about it now? So what's it like now as you look at it? Um, and again, the other group members can say how they think and feel about it and what they're seeing. And again, and then we move on 
um, once we've really got the sense of what it was like for the person. So we've got to do this thing in MBT where we say marked contingent mirroring. So we really need the person who's bought the event to feel understood by yeah. us before we can go on to consider other ways of looking at the situation. If you try and consider other perspectives too soon, you will raise the person's anxiety to a level where their mental housing collapses again mm. and they won't be able to think about that and they might feel quite insulted or angry because you're saying, look at it, it could have been this way before you've actually marked the feeling and it's really important that we do that before we move on. And then we, we look at what it was like to show us in therapy and then we move on to considering what does this look like from different perspectives, what are the possibilities. Mm. And right at the end of the session, we might we, we think, well, you know, at what point might you have done something differently or what point would good mentalising have helped you um, yeah. have a different outcome? So that's it in a nutshell. That's the process we go through. Okay, and you're going to talk us through a specific case study? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the, the scene, the, um, Debbie is the uh, patient, we call people patients here in, in treatment. Um, she, she walked in a scene, she was driving herself and her sister to college and she decided she needed to stop off to get some tea at a coffee, local coffee shop, coffee shop. She parked on double yellow lines, had a bit of an altercation with her sister about that and then went into the coffee shop where she frequently goes so she's um, she's familiar with the staff there and um, in the coffee shop she queue jumped so she tries to go right to the front of the queue and say I'm in a hurry I need to mm. can you serve me first um, which of course you know didn't go down too well with the other people in the shop she then also um, has this experience where she quite likes the coffee server that we've called him a coffee man um, but she thinks that he uh, likes her sister more than her and that her sister he, she thinks he thinks her sister is prettier and better mm -hmm. so she's got lots of difficult feelings um, in relation to this man and also she's 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 running late she's trying to jump a queue things escalate and she ends up um, being abusive to the man serving the coffee and also very um, abusive verbally abusive to her sister and then storming out of the shop and heading off and she says to us in the group she says I've fallen out with my sister there's been another incident with my sister and now we're not talking it's what well, she's always like this so that's mm. the, the way it's introduced so we want to get a bigger picture we want to understand how that's happened in okay. the group so in, in practical terms what then happens in the group do they start using pro real or she starts using yes so once we've got an overview of the event we then ask Debbie to create it in ProRia. And here we see what Debbie's created. This is the scenario. So this is a coffee shop scenario. And um, what, what, the, what we like about ProRia in terms of mentalizing is that it's really um, making you, it asks you to think about the thoughts and feelings and behaviors of each of the avatars so you you are you you have to have a go at doing that and the group will support you to do that to name feelings and thoughts that might be quite confusing and jumbled because we want to try to create to help the patient create a coherent narrative out of something that seems incoherent or non-understandable so if we start with Debbie so we can see Debbie's in purple I think I click on Debbie I'm not to do that um, so this is Debbie. So you'll see the emoticon, um, the yellow, little yellow face. So we say, what well, you know, what were you feeling? And in ProReal, you get a lot of choice about different emoticons, and that can be helpful in the group because not all people see the mm. emoticon as expressing the same emotion. So we want to help people um, come to an understanding and agreement about what feeling is being expressed mm -hmm. there. So in this, for Debbie, this is sort of anger, frustration. And these are the thoughts she's then got. I'm going to be late. He thinks she's prettier than me. Um, why is he not serving me? And then um, I'm ugly. And then the groups that we said, so you're feeling frustrated and angry, but what other feelings are there? Because that's what we also want to get to in MBT. Mm -hmm. Not just the, 
the surface feeling, we want to understand what else is going on, what might be motivating the behaviour or linked to the behaviour. And has she inputted these these comments or this text herself? Yes, okay. so she tells us. She, okay. These are her words, so this is what she would say. And in, in the group there's a touch screen, isn't it? You've got quite a large touch screen and you're yes. sat around yeah. and she's starting, she's telling her story of what yeah. it feels like. So okay. she chooses the colour and the size of her avatar um, and then she labels her thoughts and feelings. And often people struggle with their feelings. They can often um, be more clear about what they were thinking, but often struggle with feelings. That's where the group comes in and says, mm -hmm. well, if I was in that situation, I might be feeling that. Could that have been what's going on? Mm -hmm. So we share some ideas about that. We try and generate some ideas about labeling or naming um, feelings particularly. Okay. So we then go, so she then creates the other sort of players, I suppose, in the story, if you like. So we then go on to her sister, which is a green avatar. And um, we, get, um, we get her to think about what she might have been thinking. Again, you can see the feeling um, that she's come up with was that she, she thought the sister might be a bit confused or a bit disinterested. And we had a debate about this emoticon, what this actually looked like to people. So it was a, there was some mixed views about it. But um, you'll see there's no feeling um, named there. And that's because she struggled with naming. She didn't, she didn't know what her sister might feel. Mm -hmm. So again, that's where the group would come in and the group might make some suggestions about those feelings. So then she goes on to, we go on to the coffee man. So we're coffee just man. setting the scenes, the coffee man. Mm -hmm. And we want, <clears throat> we can never be sure what's in somebody else's mind. And um, good mentalizing needs us to hold on to that idea. You can never be sure what somebody else is thinking and feeling. Um, and you have to check it out. But so, but we do ask her to think. So we say to Debbie, what do you, what do you think might have been on his mind? And she says, she says well, you might be thinking, where's the other member of staff? Because he's there on his own. Mm -hmm. And then she got a bit concrete about what she thought might be on his mind. She said um, she thought he was thinking that pretty girl is here and that she's here with her psycho sister. And Debbie named herself as the psycho sister and her sister was the pretty girl. Um, she was challenged a little bit by the other patients in the group, but you, you don't want to do too much challenging because this is her story at this point. Mm -hmm. These are her thoughts and feelings and we need to trying to get that clear mm. and not influence them too much by what other people and, it, and it, at this point there's no point saying to her oh but you're not psycho sister because that's how she was feeling at the time that won't work her mentalizing is very concrete at that point and what we need to do is to help her lower her level of arousal and um, feel empathically validated by the rest of the group before we can offer a different suggestion so they said, well, what else is going on? So um, he might have thought he was busy and also he might be thinking, look at that queue. And we move on to the queue, which is the big grey. Uh, we just represented that with a big, big grey avatar. So the queue, um, she thought that when, when she was asked to think about it at the time, she wasn't really aware of the queue. But when she thought about it, thinking about it now for the group, you know, she thought, well, they might have thought, what a cheek. And then she thought, um, they probably might have thought I was crazy as well, because I was shouting at this point, mm. and I'd kind of lost it. Um, so that's the scene. So we then ask, have we got everything? Um, and is there anything else you want to add? And at this point, we can add some symbols. So we've got the wall. So she identifies that as a barrier. So she's got a bit concrete in her thinking in that that becomes the coffee counter. But then she realises it's also, a, there's some blockage between her and the other people. It's stopping them from engaging with mm. her um, very well. So that's a barrier. And then the other symbol she adds is the minefield. And this is between her and her sister. And the minefield, the thought that goes with the minefield is that she's better than me. So she labels the minefield, she's better than me. Um, and this for her represents... Um, the difficulty that she has with her sister, constantly comparing herself to, negatively yeah. to her sister. So we've created the scene and it's been represented there. We've labelled thoughts and feelings and we've got a sense of how how this is for Debbie. So whereabouts are we here? So we're, um, 
we're going to, we're, we've got the narrative of the event and we're going to, we're going to move from experience to experience at the time and then to the reflection on the events. So that's where we are at. So we ask her, we ask her then, um, what was it like for you at the time? And she tells us that it was, it was awful. She was angry. She, she just wanted to be noticed. Um, we then say, okay, so can we zoom in on what this might look like from your perspective? And this again is what, um, what ProReal um, will allow us to do. So we can zoom in and see what it's like for her um, in this scenario. And we ask her at this point, what do you make of it? Looking at it now, what do you make of it? And we ask the group, you know, what do you make of what you're seeing? Um, mm. And all sorts of things come up. So, so you can see she's hemmed in there, really. She looks a bit trapped. She's feeling, she says she feels a bit trapped. Um, she's feeling unimportant, like she's not been noticed. She's getting more and more frustrated um, because she's just not getting any sort of response um, in terms of um, any sort of feedback from this coffee man that she kind of likes and is not giving mm. her any, pretty much any eye contact. So she's, she's not feeling so good. So, and we ask the group, we say, what do you imagine it's like for Debbie now? You know, what do you imagine mm. that's like for her? Because it's at this point we want to really empathise with her. We do this thing called um, um, empathic validation in MBT, where we really, as I said before, try and understand what what it's like. And we say, you know, what we think it might feel like for her, how we might feel in that situation. We say, is that right? Have we got it? Is this is this what it was like for you? And when we get the confirmation that we've marked her, her affect well enough, mm. we can then move on. So we go into roaming view then. So we take a step back in, in the um, in reel. And then we say, what do you, you know, looking at it now from this distance, what do you think about it? So we then, this is when we start to get um, views from other people in the group. And we can also ask Debbie, what do, what do you think about it? Looking at it now, what, what comes to mind? Um, and so we begin to get in touch with a little bit of embarrassment, wishing that it hadn't gone that way, some difficult feelings, not comfortable. Um, and she begins to think, she begins to say things like, well, ooh, I'm beginning to realise how I might look to other people when I'm in that state. Mm. Um, so that's helpful because she's taken a step back. So she's not too upset in the session and she's able to reflect on her behaviour. So she's still mentalising in the session. That's what we want. We want her to stay thinking and we want the rest of the group to support her doing that. And we ask her, what's it been like to show us this? Um, because we want to think about what her feeling state is right now in the moment. What's mm. it like to share this with us? Um, and she, she said, oh, it's, it's a bit embarrassing. I feel a little bit bad about it. Um, and at that point, um, the other group members, they start to become a bit more supportive in their comments. So they'll say things like, well, you know, I've been in a similar situation. You're not the only person that, you know, lost it in public. You know, we've been there and you're doing really well showing us this now. So they're trying to keep her arousal down a little bit. Um, supportive, normalizing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So being supportive. And once we've got... Um, what it's like for her we then move on in the process and we say um, is it okay to take a look at the scene um, and what it might look like to other people in the scenario and again ProReal really does this beautifully it, you can zoom in from get other other views so if we zoom in to um, the sister so we look at how the situation looks from the sister so in the group I'd say to the group so what do you make of that? You know, mm. what's your impression of what you see? Um, and the, the thing, uh, looking back on the group now, I think the first thing that they said is, well, nobody's there. You know, sister's not there. She's completely preoccupied. You know, it looks like she's um, fairly distant, uh, in fact. So, um, and that's quite mm. surprising because t to Debbie, she was involved. She was interfering. She was flirting with the coffee man. There are all these interactions that Debbie thought the sister was having, but when we look at it from this way, we're not saying this is the truth of the situation, we're just saying mm. this is a possibility. Mm. It's possible 
that she was just doing her own thing. So um, we then go into other views. We ask Debbie, you know, is it is it okay? Can we move on? So we can go to the queue. So we look at things um, from the perspective of the people in the queue and say, you yeah, know, what do you notice about that? And actually what we noticed about that is actually they look quite threatening. They're a bit of an angry sort of mob and that's quite scary um, for anybody looking on. Mm. Um, and um, and that, that although Debbie says she wasn't aware of them in the moment, there will have been a sense of an angry group of people nearby, which mm. can't help, mm. can't help to mentalise him. And um, then we move on to Coffee Man. <laughs> I love this man. <clears throat> So the view from Coffee Man, so if we think that what Debbie thought was that the Coffee Man was flirting with her sister and that he thought her sister was, um, you know, she, that, that she thought her sister and him were sort of um, having an exchange. Actually, Coffee Man looks rather preoccupied. And that's what the group said, actually, he doesn't, he, he just looks like he's preoccupied. He doesn't look like he's paying any particular attention to anyone. Um, he looks busy and kind of um, maybe towards the queue a bit we're a bit worried about the queue um, but what we don't what we see there is that Debbie's disappeared almost from the scene so that was one of the mm. things the group members said look she where are you you know you can't be seen and she and so Debbie says yeah that, that's it that's what it was like it's like nobody ever sees me you can see my sister and there's other people there nobody sees me um, and that really um, tapped in some, to some really hurt feelings and um, feelings of rejection, which of course in somebody with borderline personality disorder, the sense of rejection is what often leads to um, very difficult behaviour and collapses in mentalising. This idea of abandonment is horrific to them and causes enormous pain. So this was really difficult for um, Debbie. And so we don't want to, um, we don't really um, want to leave her with that but before we move on we say you know what's it been like for you to see this you know to have a look at this and we ask the rest of the group that what's that been like um, and to generate some thoughts and feelings any new thoughts and feelings you have about the situation and that sort of that tends to generate lots of ideas about people are often um, rather reflective in my experience they've been very reflective about how they might come across to other people in terms of when they were feeling a particular way, they were unaware that they actually appeared quite aggressive to others or they were actually behaving in a way that would be difficult for somebody to actually stand and listen in a neutral, mm. thoughtful way. Um, so Debbie was able to say, well, actually, you know, I'm, I can see that I may come across as quite difficult at times. Um, um, this has really pointed that out to me in a kind of good way. She said, I sort of knew it, but it's helpful to see it on screen. It's helpful to um, think about it from other people's points of views. And I've never really thought about the people in the queue or the impact I was having, or that, that I might have misunderstood completely what's going on between my sister and the coffee man. And you mentioned earlier something about when the group talk about the protagonists or the, the, the people in these scenes, they talk about that avatar. Right? Yes, the yeah, yeah. They tend, yeah, they do tend to depersonalise a bit because they can then say some quite difficult things. So, mm -hmm. so for example, they'll say, your, your avatar, it's really aggressive and I might be frightened by that, rather than saying, De you, you, Debbie, you look scary and frightening. Mm -hmm. um, so that's helpful. Again, it creates enough distance so that these, you keep everybody in the room mentalising. You ask what you want to do. You just you're trying to strengthen people's capacity to mentalise in stressful interpersonal situations. Yeah. So what we go on to then is um, we we think with Debbie about whether there was a point at which, if her mentalising had been stronger, she might have taken you she might have done anything differently or at what point might you have created a pause mm. um, at what point might things have been different mm. and if we just go out to roaming yeah go to roaming view um so that we can get a sense of that so then what um because you can see that it's you know when she is feeling unnoticed 
ugly in comparison to her sister and she's been reminded of all of that that might leave her with some quite strong feelings mm. so she she thinks so she can think a bit about well actually perhaps if I'd, I, I knew I was going to be late for college so I shouldn't really stop in the coffee shop mm. in the first place you know that's a very practical thing that she might have done and we also talk about what's come up in terms of her relationship with her sister because that's definitely something that needs a lot more work on more than we can do in one very real session mm. so that we advise we say and the group members say oh, we, you know you really need to bring that to group you've not really talked about that very much before mm. um can we think about that with you in the other groups um so we, we advise that and then we we don't want to for some of the pro real sessions the final image is quite powerful or it might be powerfully upsetting in some way so for some sessions and in debbie's session when she was feeling trapped in behind that wall um we wanted to um say to her or we did say to her what would you, you know what would you have to do to change this how could we change this scenario so that you feel a bit you know a bit easier a bit better about it so she says well actually i should just walk away so you're going to help me help her walk away, aren't you? So we'll do that. Um, and what I found in the pro-real sessions, not just with this one, but with other sessions, is when when there's um, people get kind of a bit tense, and you can see it in their shoulders and their breathing in the actual session. And when they do this, when they do this walking away, there's been, in my experience, um, a breathing out, like a letting go of a breath. And it was the same for Debbie. It was like, Phew. I've got out of that enclosed space, so I'm not trapped anymore. So we then end the session by saying, have we done enough for today? Is that enough? Um, and in this situation, it, it was. Great. Penny, thank you. And uh, I think we've got some time now for some questions. So questions, thoughts, observations. Uh, either put your hand up or just come off mute um, or, or send us a message. Penny, it's Andrew, just to, to give some context. How, how many people would typically be in a, a group session here? Well, in, in the pro real group sessions, we had a maximum of six at any one time. It, it tended to be three or four, and that seemed to be a good number. Generated enough ideas and different perspectives, but wasn't also too big to see the screen and interact with the touch screen and things like that. Mm, thank you. Question here, what's the advantage of this over, for example, a group constellation process? Um, I don't know what group constellation process is. So um, if you had the group in the room, um, uh, instead of having avatars, you've got real people in the room constellating and um, like um, setting out the system or the scene. So like um, a psychodrama. Like a psychodrama. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I, I don't know about what, what the, the pluses for the avatar is. It's just that um, the avatar created a distance, an emotional distance that I think real humans that might be difficult to do that with people with borderline personality disorder because there's so much room for misinterpreting facial expressions and gestures in a psychodrama that might be very difficult actually to get everybody doing what you mm. want them to do at any given time. Mm. Um, I suppose you could do a sculpt that might be helpful and then talk about it, you know, that way you get freeze yeah. frame. That, that might work. But I think this helped everybody in the group um, get a, a, um, an overview or um, to understand the process of a collapse in mentalizing from a distance. Mm. Whereas if you're immersed in, a, in a, a psychodrama, you are in it and you're in your own feelings much more, I think, than you are if you're watching something on the screen. And we don't, we, we've got to keep the level of arousal down with the borderline patient because if you overstimulate the level of arousal, then their mentalizing collapses mm -hmm. and you get the concrete thinking. Um, people get very 
certain that what's in their head is real and misinterpret things. So, so how long is a typical session? So these sessions lasted anything between 45 and 60 minutes, depending on the numbers of people in the room and depending on the complexity of the scenario. And my, my experience of psychodrama is you need quite an extensive part of contracting and warming up before getting into psychodrama and then debriefing. Yeah, so that, yeah. Okay, so you, um, okay, thanks for that. How much time were they using in the group or creating their own picture? That's from Becky. So, um, in we in the in creating the picture, we took about the same time as I've taken now in terms of setting up the scene. Um, but of course, we talk much more. There's so much more that I could have added into this in terms of the exploring of thoughts and feelings and checking things out with one another and the actions of other group members. Um, but it ten, it tends to be a sort of ongoing process throughout the throughout the group. We might add and revise it as we go along. Um, you can change the avatars, you can change the scenery or set up something different somewhere else um, if you want to add another bit to the story. So it can go on. One last question here, how many avatar scenarios are there? Which ones? Does that mean, um, perhaps that means scenery? It might mean, Veronica, do you want to just come off mute to ask a bit more about that question? Yes. If it's about landscape, we have no, a land... I'm, yes, yeah, is I'm, it about the landscape, Veronica? Yeah, landscape, uh, um, situation, how long does it take to create each situation? Quite a long time, I imagine. No, it can be. It can be. Um, it can take as long as you want. Really, it depends how much work you're doing. I mean, some people I think have used ProReal and they've gone away and created stories that go on and on and on. Um, but in this situation, we tended to be able to set up the scene within about um, uh, ten to fifteen minutes, and then we work through the mentalizing trajectory process. Um, for the rest of the session. So it, it doesn't take too long. Great. Okay, thank Thanks you. Thanks for the question, Veronica. And uh, we'll come back to a final Q&A in, in another 10 minutes or so. But what I'd like to do is to hand over to Caroline, Dr. Caroline Faulkner of MindTech, who's going to talk us through some of the research, Caroline. I am. You Thanks know. very much. Um, I'm just going to share. screen share, Caroline? Yes, I'm going to share my screen okay. with you, um, you. now as I have a few slides. So if you just bear with me a minute as it... Oh, apparently I can't share while David is sharing. That's what I just wondered, so give me a moment. Um, Lovely, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I shall share my desktop. So if you bear with me one moment. So I am a research fellow at the University of Nottingham and I work within a research group called MindTech. So we're a bit of a multidisciplinary hub um, of psychiatrists, psychologists, engineers, human factors, sociologists, and our remit is really to collaborate with academics, to collaborate with industries such as ProReal and also um, uh, clinicians like Penny and, and um, mental health services to kind of bring together all of those areas to um, advance mental health technology. So we partnered up with, with Penny and ProReal and uh, created a very small scale study that I will take you through in a minute. And it's, it's really about asking the questions whether um, an avatar adjunct to mentalization-based treatment or avatar MBT, as I'll refer to, uh, is it feasible and is it acceptable to patients? So just to talk very quickly about the design um, we had all together in our, our in our small study, we recruited 15 participants. These were predominantly female, so we had two males. Um, 11 of these participants completed the full program of, of the research. Four dropped out either because they had finished therapy altogether or they dropped out of therapy altogether. 
The procedure, as um, Penny's just outlined to you, um, was employed across four sessions. So we just decided to to let people have these these avatar MBT sessions uh, four times, predominantly in a group setting. But some, in fact, four had um, individual one-to-one -one sessions with Penny, either because they they chose to, they felt like they needed to, or because actually attendance to the group was was very low, and that that meant that they ended up having a one-to-one -one session with Penny. So these were four sessions at approximately weekly intervals, and um, at each session we had participants. Uh, fill in questionnaires. So we had some quantitative data which was measuring mood and their mentalization skills. This is just self-report questionnaire data. And we also had qualitative interviews at the end where they had a, a, about a 20-minute conversation with myself over the phone and that was to get a um, to sort of gauge their attitudes and their beliefs towards ProReal and whether they thought that there was any beneficial or indeed um, not be in no beneficial effects to, to ProReal. The type of analysis that we used, we used multi, uh, univariate statistics for the self-report measures, which I'll talk very briefly about, and then we used the thematic analysis for the qualitative interviews, which I'll also briefly go through. But as Penny suggested, um, at the beginning we had, I guess, a few hypotheses as to why um, using this avatar MBT might be beneficial um, and, and these were kind of twofold. So the first was in that the, the ProReal affords people this perspective taking ability by um, taking the perspective of different avatars that you lay out on the, sc uh, on the screen and also this, this um, roaming viewer, this free camera where you can have a sort of bird's eye view of whatever scene it is that you create. And we also thought that having this sort of visual and interactive mode of delivery would facilitate the therapy. It's an incredibly mentally taxing therapy for both um, the clinician and, and the patient, having to, to micro-slice events, keep all of those, uh, keep all of that process in mind, open it up to the group. The group also has to keep this all in mind. It's an incredibly taxing process for everybody. And we thought that having that visual and interactive age uh, aid would help facilitate the process. So that's um, our thinking behind the study. Now, in terms of quantitative results, just excuse this graph, uh, this table full of numbers. It's uh, <laughs> not very pleasant to look at, but we, we measured mood and we measured um, mentalization skills. We measured these across um, the four sessions. We didn't find any changes in these measures, but actually that wasn't necessarily the point of, of administering them. And also, this is a four-week um, gauge of, of mood and mentalization out of an 18-month program. And of course, um, the patients or the participants of the study were at various stages of that program as well. So we weren't actually expecting to see any positive changes in short, such a short um, time scale. But I suppose the, the really interesting part of this and the comforting part is that no one really declined on these measures during um, the, the avatar MBT either, which is an important point to, to make. But the really interesting results, I think, come from our qualitative data, so the interviews that um, I did with uh, patients. Um, and we use a thematic analysis to this. I, I'm not sure how um, familiar people are about thematic analysis, but really it's a, it's a bottom-up approach, a uh, bottom-up method to identifying patterns and trends within your qualitative data, so interview data. And you go through a set process of familiarizing yourself with the data once it's transcribed. You will generate and assign codes to that data, so descriptive labels um, that you would then um, identify as codes to um, segments of, of the, the transcripts that really tell you something. And then you would sort those codes into meaningful themes. And then you would go through a process of reviewing and, and strengthening those themes and really being interpretive about those themes. So it's a very bottom-up approach, very organic approach. You're not trying to fit the data to your own hypotheses. Yeah. Um, and the results from that, we had what, what we would classify as six themes. And for me, I, I think these are incredibly valuable and, and, and very rich, and they hint towards kind of mechanisms of change that may be brought about through using the avatar MBTs. So the first one is really about the 
that visualization helps the client or the patient to understand and express themselves. So we find that the visual nature, the interactive nature of the software allows people to express themselves and therefore build up an understanding of their self in that moment and other people as well. And it's this process of visual narrative that they also get to, to label their thoughts, um, emotions and behaviours and begin to look at the relationships between them. So I put up some quotes here. I won't read through every quote, but it's um, quotes from the data that support this theme of visualisation. It helps me express myself and understand myself. Um, so you know, the participant said it was good to visualize, it was just to, to see something in, in front of you um, and whether they were expressing themselves through the landscape, through props, through the colors of the avatar, the behaviors that you can ascribe or postures that you can ascribe to the avatars as well as all of the emoticons um, the props that you could use. Um, you know, they, they, they like this and they like the interactive nature of it, which you could change it and then you could get interactive with the perspective as well. The second uh, theme that was coming up was that the visual narrative helps me keep track and participate in the group session. So this was really... Um, uh, endorsing our, our one of our hypotheses that, it, that Avatar MBT would help facilitate this really complex and taxing process for both the, the therapist and, and the um, patients. So a lot of people corroborated this hypothesis by saying that they have trouble with the standard version of MBT, they had trouble concentrating, they had trouble following what's happening and therefore, you know, difficulty actually contributing to the group. Um, but they said that being able to see it physically in front of them and then to go through it bit by bit was really helpful and that from this they could provide more feedback um, than they usually would. And also people said that it got everybody in, involved in the talking. You were able to see it and you were able to remember um, either their, their own event that they would bring or the event of someone else um, that is the, the topic uh, within the group. So a really important point here. It seemed to hone attention as well, and there's um, something to be said within this clinical population as well on, on um, honing their attention skills and um, reducing their impulsivity. The third theme was, um, as Penny suggested, allows people to take the, to take the big picture. There was lots of reports of um, the, the software allowing them to take a step back, to get the big picture, to give a sort of holistic perspective um, to the situation that's, that's being described. It's quite often the case that people are sm focused on a very, very minute uh, part of, of the incident and they're not very aware of, of other things that are happening around them, as Penny has demonstrated um, with, with her example. And um, the... The avatar software gives people this, this space to, to reflect on the situation as a whole. Now the fourth one is, is again sort of um, honing into our original hypothesis is that um, avatars help me take and understand another person's perspective. So through the perspective taking function of the software where you could um, view a situation uh, either from just behind an avatar or through the eyes of an avatar, you're getting a sense of another person's perspective. So we had a lot of participants say that you could literally see what was going on for that other person and they felt that it was easier to notice. Now this might be uh, just a visual perspective um, taking uh, enhancement, but that might lead to a sort of more cognitive enhancement of perspective taking, get a better understanding of uh, how that person was actually feeling and thinking in the moment. And I mean, participants also said that, of course, you would never really know what that person felt in that exact moment, but this gives you the opportunity to um, to think that uh, another perspective is is possible. The fifth one is um, something that was incredibly interesting that came out of the data and this is this idea that the software gave participants um, distance to think clearly. So if I just read the first part of this quote, which I think is, is brilliant, um, this male uh, participant says that um, to take all of these thoughts and feelings out of my head and out of my body and to put it in front of me as a separate thing is kind of revolutionary. So these people, uh, these participants are gaining paradoxically some sort of distance um, 
to the situation that they're describing, but you know the effect of, of doing this through ProRail is, is quite powerful for them. And as Penny said, it's a way about trying to regulate arousal during the session to regulate emotions in a way that um, is manageable for them so that they can engage with the topic as opposed to being overcome by those emotions again and uh, losing mentalization in, in, in the process of, of discussing it within the group. So it's a really important point that ProReal um, and Avatar MBT gives this, this distance that is um, therapeutically beneficial to participants. And then finally, we found out that um, when we were trying to understand where um, the use of Avatar MBT would be best placed within, within the service. So as Penny mentioned, they do get one-to-one -one sessions, um, but they also have group, group sessions where other people can contribute. And everyone said that they thought that the Avatar MBT was best placed within a group setting so that other people could give their own perspectives. They saw the benefit of, yes, doing a one-to-one -one session if more detail was required, more time was needed on, on an event, or if it was a particularly personal event. But they all said that, uh, first and foremost, it should be used within a group setting. Now, in terms of what we can conclude from this and our future directions, you know, our results um, are qualitative. They, um, they show a promising um, potential for, for uh, MBT uh, to be adjuncted by, by ProReal, to have this avatar MBT. So it's, a f it's feasible to do it. Penny's shown that it's feasible to do it. Um, from our qualitative data, it's acceptable to, 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 the, to the patients. And I have to emphasize as well, I've never experienced such positivity and enthusiasm towards an intervention um, as, as this group gave over the, over the phone to me. They were incredibly enthusiastic about it and every single person wanted to continue using the software. And also I think our data shows or certainly hints at the potential mechanisms of change um, that uh, Avatar MBT uh, could bring and that's something that we need to take into, into the future and into future studies. Um, we need to establish the clinical effectiveness of uh, avatar MBT, which means a, a larger trial, a, a more controlled trial. We need to look uh, and establish, as I said, these mechanisms of change, which we can do through certain um, research designs. And we need to kind of establish um, the potential impact on, on, on the service. So given that people are so enthusiastic about it and are, are saying that they see the benefits of it, is this a way to accelerate or shorten uh, MBT or maybe perhaps improve adherence and then of course those would have an impact on um, the economic costs of, of, of the therapy so we have to begin to establish the health economic case of this type of therapy as well. Mm, yeah. And um, yeah, and that's uh, just a very, very short summary of, of the study. It's currently, um, it's written up uh, as a manuscript and it's currently under uh, review at the moment. So we're hoping that that will be published for everybody pretty soon. And obviously these people down the left hand side are, are everybody involved in, in the project and a big thanks goes out to, to all of these people, including the IT services at, at SLAM and also all of the, the, the patients involved at Touchstone. Caroline, thank you. You're Wonderful. Well, we've got some time now at the end of this webinar to take more questions. Uh, so questions for either Penny or Caroline would be most welcome. And again, you can put your hands up or unmute or send a message over the group chat. I've got one quick, while you're all thinking about what to ask, I've got a question for Penny. What mm -hmm. makes for ProReal here? Okay, so um, the patients liked it so much, which was, I have to say, is a shock to me, <laughs> um, but they liked it so much, um, I've got approval to buy the license for a year to introduce it to the programme here, so it would be an op option for some of our patients Brilliant. As, as an addition to, to their um, treatment, yeah. That's wonderful. Oh, that is great news. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well done. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions for the floor? We've got another five minutes. So, um, Anything else you want to know for any of us around here, Penny, Caroline, or anyone in the ProReal team? Mm. 
we have just thrown that a lot of information at you, so we mm -hmm. <laughs> need to digest a bit. I mean, I think it's um, what's quite unique about this um, is that we've shown a digital adjunct to, to therapy within a group setting, which isn't particularly common. Um, you have maybe online um, C CBT group sessions, but um, this is really something that's adjuncting the therapy process, which is, is very nice. And, and it's, I guess, Penny, it's, it's nice to, to see that they're so enthusiastic about doing it in a group, because this is about, you know, inter and intrapersonal relationships. Yes. Um, and, it's, and it's great that they see the benefit of it being within a group. Well, with, with um, this client group, they really struggle. Group is where people struggle the most mm. with, uh, and where their mentalizing collapses the most because mm. it's so hard, as you said, to hold other people's minds in mind and pay attention to yourself at the same time. We're really asking them to do a very uh, difficult task. So this seems to have made that task a little bit more bearable um, and also um, the other bits of feedback I had was that people were saying, the patients that participated said it then from doing the avatar sessions, they were then able to think about that in the, the ordinary MBT sessions and they could think about events to bring in much, mm. e much more easily and think about what they could say because they were doing that um, with, the, with the avatar. It was. It made it easier somehow. It was mm. translatable. Mm -hmm. A question just coming through there. Hold on a second, Penny. What was the biggest challenge for you to start using the software with your clients? Oh, my own absolute lack of IT and skill and fear and um, <laughs> phobia of <laughs> anything to do with any, any technology. Um, you, the patients were, were I have to say, most of the patients were much younger than me because I'm very old. And um, they were so much more au fait with the, um, with the whole gaming sort of um, world. And they knew how to navigate. When I didn't know how to navigate or I lost an avatar in the scenery, they were able to come in and because we had the touch screen and they'd come and mm. um, we'd laugh about it. And then they'd come bring find the avatar and bring it back into the scene where we wanted it. So it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't persuading the, the patient so much as me. I was, I was the biggest challenge because I just, um, it's absolutely outside of mm. my comfort zone. It's not, it's just something I wasn't familiar with. <laughs> Another question here. I'm interested to know if any specific software has been developed to work with anxiety. That's from Becky. And I noticed Kate. Kate Anthony's here as well. Kate, welcome. Mm -hmm. um, uh, be lovely to hear from you, maybe on this as well. But, um, if anybody knows of any avatar or, sorry, any software to work with anxiety, um, please pass something on to Becky. Just Once worth, then. David, just worth mm. saying, anxiety was one of the significant issues covered in our school-based research program um, that Professor Mick Cooper did earlier in the year or late last year now so um, certainly we've had experience of working with young people with anxiety so um, happy to share more on that separately Becky if you need it. Um, one other question uh, my understanding from your research is the feedback show that participants got to the heart of issues more quickly I'm interested in know if your clinical in your clinical thoughts around this when as a psychotherapist we learned that the time in the process and building the therapeutic relationship are an important part of developing resilience. Getting to the issue quicker concerns me. Me, What do you think? Hmm. Well, I think because this was an adjunct, it's part of an 18-month treatment program. So we weren't going to be doing anything quicker. This wasn't a shortcut. Maybe that will come in the future. I don't know. But it was... Um, it was, uh, we weren't trying to speed anything up, we were just trying to um, enhance the experience of the, the overall treatment. I think you're right, there is, there is a whole, you know, in MBT, the, the biggest um, thing that the individual therapist, their job is to form an attachment with the patient, the patient um, and create a relationship that's safe so that the patient can make use of the groups and that takes time. 
Um, so it's not something I would see that's rushed. And we know that NICE guidelines say that you shouldn't do anything under about four months, I think, with people with borderline personality dis disorder, because you'll actually overstimulate their attachment systems and make things worse. So you don't want to be, you wouldn't want to be introducing a very short therapy for treatment of borderline personality disorder, because it, it, it might cause more problems. Understood. Mm. Okay, thank you. I think, um, um, thank I think there's a really um, interesting point, actually, that is, seems to be a recurrent theme um, in the sense that, uh, certainly from, from, from therapists, is that you get to the stuff more quickly. And I think it, and it's a, a valid question, actually, um, Becky, but I think, and that's something certainly that we need to explore, but I think there's something very unique in the therapeutic relationship when you are using the software. So certainly when we've used it, uh, or Penny's used it, and our other collaborators when they're using it with young people is, is, is a sense of collaboration. Um, so in Penny's case, we had participants saying it was really nice because they and Penny were, were learning together how to use this and um, in the case of, of the young person they they felt that um, they know the visual tech better so they they they, they had some sort of um, something to bring to, to the session um, that the the therapist in in our in our child um, child studies um, uh, didn't have that expertise so it was uh, certainly something unique happening there in terms of the therapeutic relationship mm. that you may mm. not get otherwise. Um, so it's a, a very interesting okay. point and it's something that Good we have question. to be very cautious of. Yeah. And um, we more of this will unfold of course in the years to come as we learn more about working with avatars and mm. digital solutions I'm sure. I need to bring this to a close and I notice some more questions have appeared and we will keep the chat open for a while if you want to exchange um, questions and we'll, we'll do what we can to answer at this end but I, I'd like to formally bring it to a close by saying a huge thank you to Penny it's, it's been you. wonderful to be sat here and hearing your story <laughs> and uh, and to Caroline at Mindtech thank you Caroline as ever for for bringing great clarity to some <laughs> to this and presenting <laughs> the, the complex numbers in a beautiful way so uh, so thank you and thank you everybody for taking the time to participate we will be making a recording of this so uh, look out for the link on the website um, if you want to share a recording of this with any of your friends and colleagues. Thanks for all the questions, thanks for participating, and we'll close here. Thanks everyone. Thanks Caroline. Lovely Thank to see you Kate.